it's a n instead of o n and i'm sorry dylan <laughs> Very good. Nice. Mary Jo, you can start. Thank you. Welcome to the League of Women Voters Davis City Council District 2 Candidates Forum. Thanks to all the, the candidates for participating in our forum. This forum is also sponsored by the Davis Media Access. Davis Media Access is the nonprofit community media center serving Yolo County. Davis Media Access mission is to enrich and strengthen the community by, by, by providing alternatives to community, uh, commercial media for local voices, opinions, and creative endeavors. My name is Mary Jo Bryan. I'm the current president of the League of Women Voters of Davis. As many of you know, both the city of Davis and the Davis Joint Unified School District have moved from at-large elections where we all vote for city council or for school trustees to district elections, where we vote for a candidate who lives in the district where we live. The city of Davis map was shown on the screen. Shows city council district two. The district includes parts of North and central Davis with boundaries on the west of 113, the south of Russell Boulevard, and on the east by Oak Avenue and Catalina. Our moderator for today's forum is Donna Neville. Donna is, an act, is active in Davis as the vice chair of the City Finance and Budget Commission and as the chair of the Davis Joint Unified School District's Measure M Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Donna retired a few years ago after serving as a chief counsel for the California State Auditors. Thank you, welcome, and on, onward, Donna, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Donna Neville, and I will serve as the moderator for this afternoon's District 2 Forum. Here's a quick rundown of the rules that we're gonna be following and the format we'll be using. Each candidate will give a two minute opening statement. After opening statements, candidates will respond to up to six moderated questions. Three of these questions were provided to you a week ago. Each candidate will have 90 seconds for the initial response to each question. You'll be advised of your time by the timekeeper with a 15 second and a five second warning 
and a bell will chime when your time is up. And then you, you will be muted if you exceed the time limit. Um, also, we're just a reminder, candidates, please mute your audio when you're not speaking and responding to a question. The league has determined the order of candidates by random number drawing. Prior to this afternoon, candidates have been advised of their order of speaking. We're initially going to begin with Dylan Horton, followed by Will Arnold and then Colin Walsh, and we'll move through the rotation as we go. After the primary question responses are completed by all the candidates, I will ask if any candidate wants to add a secondary response. Candidates will have each have five opportunities during the forum for a secondary response of 40 seconds each. If there are no additional candidate responses to a particular question, I will go on to the next question. To indicate that you would like to make a secondary response to a question, please use the raise hands feature of Zoom. You find that under the participants button. Click on that and just go to your name, or at the lower right corner, just hit raise hand. Um, I will do my best to call on you and, and respond to you in the order in which you hit that button. I'll do my best to make sure I recognize you in order. Um, at the conclusion of the moderated questions and responses, each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement. And for those of you watching, just note that we will disable chat at the beginning of the main part of this forum and we'll enable it when the main forum is concluded. So we would like you to submit questions and we welcome them, but in order to submit questions, you should submit them via email. And I think Kamal's gonna show that email again on the screen, but it's ask, it's ask.lw vda at gmail.com and i'm going to repeat that again and i'll repeat it again later in the forum you see it now on the screen it's ask.lwvda at gmail.com please submit questions that are general and can be addressed to all candidates questions that are addressed to a single candidate won't be used um, after the main part of the forum, we're going to take a short break so that our question manager can collate the questions and get them back to me. And during that short break, uh, Mary Jo Bryan will give you a little more information about the League of Women Voters. Uh, we'll close with the audience questions. That'll take about a half an hour. And during that time, candidates will have one minute to respond to audience questions with the opportunity for a secondary response of 30 seconds. So, so right now we're gonna to turn to opening statements of two minutes each from the candidates and we are going to begin with Dylan Horton. Thank you, Dylan, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm uh, really glad to be with you all uh, and take part in this conversation about the future of our community. Um, as far as my day job, I work uh, for a local nonprofit doing employment support for people with developmental disabilities. As far as my role in the city, I'm currently the chair of the Davis Police Accountability Commission and have been on that commission uh, for the past two years. Um, I decided to run for Davis City Council um, uh, at the beginning of last year because I believe we need from the top to the bottom of our government, more elected leaders who live closer to the crises affecting uh, many working class Davisites and residents across our community on a daily basis. The crisis of our housing crisis, excuse me, uh, the crisis of um, our economic downturn and the lack of jobs uh, and opportunity in our communities. Uh, and of course, um, the challenges and continuing crisis uh, that institutions perpetuate in racism uh, in our community, um, particularly law enforcement in this current time. Uh, I'm running to bring that perspective, I think, of, of people who haven't been in the elected offices in Davis for, um, for many years now. And I think uh, we can do better to readily address these issues of, house, of the housing crisis, of economic development, of uh, reforming our local law enforcement system so that they can be more uh, inclusive and they can provide a sense of security and safety um, to everyone in our community. 
Uh, I'm looking forward to the, the rest of our conversation today, but if uh, folks are looking uh, to hear more information about me and to find more about my background uh, and my uh, priority focuses, they can take a look at dylanfordavis.com. And I know my first name is spelled uh, kind of funny. It's D-I-L-L-A-N, the number four, davis.com. And I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. And now we're going to move to Will Arnold for his opening statement. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank the league, not only for today, but for everything you do, largely unsung. Uh, now more than ever, your commitment to protecting our democracy is truly vital. I also want to give a huge shout out to all our statewide firefighters, as well as our own Davis firefighters who've joined the statewide effort to keep us safe here at home. And thank you to everyone joining us here today. Your participation gets to the heart of who we are. As a community, we've always sought to shape our policies by the values we share. We have faced adversity before and done so with perseverance, resilience, and innovation, and used challenges to learn and adapt. And although most of what's happening in our country we could never have imagined before, now is no different. I look forward to digging into our local issues today, but I wanted to share a few thoughts to start out. It would be easy to be fatigued dispirited and cynical about things right now. Let's face it, things are truly difficult. But there's also a spirit of resistance and resilience that gives me hope because I know we're not defined by our challenges, but by how we overcome them. Addressing systemic racial injustice has needed to happen for a long time, but as a society, this feels like the first time we've talked this openly, broadly, and honesty, honestly. And as a father of mixed race children, I'm encouraged and I look forward to continuing to push this conversation locally. Climate change has been a critical issue addressed by our community for decades, but it feels like it's finally coming out of the shadows and is on the table for all to see. And finally, our national political scene is a mess and it's hard not to be consumed by it. But I would urge everyone to vote from president all the way down the ballot. Local policy is where we have the greatest personal impact and it's where we have a chance to push back and hold the line. We need experienced leadership that can effectively advocate for our values. Thank you for being here and I look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Will. And now we're gonna move on to Colin Walsh. Colin, please go ahead with your opening statement. Good afternoon. Thank you to the League of Women Voters uh, Davis area for this opportunity today. I have to say I'm so glad the league is back and I know that that's taken a, an enormous effort from everyone involved and I appreciate all of you for doing it. It is uh, so important for our local democracy here. Uh, last Friday, uh, a week ago this Friday, I guess I, I went in for a routine gallbladder surgery, uh, but unfortunately a complication sent me into an emergency second surgery and I only just returned home yesterday morning. I'm thankful to be home with my family after a week at, at Sutter, the Sutter Hospital. But please excuse me today if I seem a little less energetic. I'm just so grateful to be here after this uh, unexpected turn. I, I'm Colin Walsh, I grew up here in Davis. I have two kids in the local schools. I uh, take care of my 82 year old mother and uh, I've been involved in the city for many years in many different ways. And I, I would just be thrilled to have the opportunity to represent District 2 as a city council person. And so I hope today to give you some good reasons uh, to vote for me. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. So now we're going to turn to our moderated questions. And the order of uh, responses this time will begin with Will Arnold, followed by Colin Walsh, and then Dylan Horton. The question is, although the city council will continue to govern all of Davis, if elected, you will serve the voters of a specific district. What are the top needs or issues of your district and how do you propose to address them? Well, that's a great question. It's one that comes up um, as I talk to voters in the district. As, as, as we all know, this is the first time uh, the, the city of Davis has done uh, district elections. Uh, both our school board and our city uh, will be elected, not citywide as we have done for for decades, uh, but uh, by district. Uh, and, and while you are exactly correct that if elected, no matter where uh, someone is elected from, uh, they'll be making decisions that not only uh, affect the entire city, 
but could be in the heart of a, of, of a different district. And that's important to recognize. You know, I was elected four years ago uh, citywide in the penultimate citywide uh, uh, City of Davis uh, Council election. Uh, and I had uh, broad support from throughout the city. Uh, and I still am very pleased to have support uh, of my entire city council uh, colleagues uh, and many folks throughout the district. Uh, and so I will certainly be governing, uh, should I be fortunate enough to earn a second term, uh, be governing with an eye on this entire city uh, that, that I was born and raised in and that I love. Um, although uh, um, Davis is not as um, split up as many other cities in terms of need, there are some needs that, uh, that folks in our district have recognized. Um, homeless camps that are around our district, that's one of them. Uh, Maybe I'll use my opportunity to talk some more about the district needs. Thank you. Thank you, Will. So now we're going to turn to Colin Walsh to answer that question. Thank you. Um, in listening to community members during my grassroots campaign, um, the issues I'm hearing most frequently are uh, concern for the economic viability of our downtown and uh, concern for our stores, uh, the impacts of people camping in our neighborhoods and uh, residential property crime. Those are, those are definitely three repeated themes. Um, I'm also talking to voters throughout the town and, I, I am, I'm, and what I'm hearing from voters throughout the city is concern for the city's financial health and a desire for transparent and accessible government process. And I'm, I'm hearing that from across, across the city really. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And now we go to Dylan Horton. Please go ahead, Dylan. Thank you. Um, I, I believe that it's really important for uh, council members elected after this election um, to really see the entire city as something that they are responsible for and making policy for. I, I think there's no situation, even if something is entirely you know, uh, located outside of the district one is representing or one was elected to, there's no lower degree of responsibility that you have as a council member to make good policy for the entirety of the city and for the city's future. Um, I, I do think that there are gonna be some cases where um, something is going on, you know, squarely within the boundaries of the district. And I think it's appropriate for that council member elected from that district to give maybe some increased special attention to that uh, particular issue. Um, but I don't believe that there's any uh, issue in Davis, uh, regardless of where it's located in town, uh, that would warrant less attention uh, from a city council member just because of the districts. I think we, we serve the entire city, we make policy for the entire city, and that's how um, uh, a council member should organize their thoughts and actions. Thank you, Dylan. Um, does any does anyone wish to make a secondary response? I'm not seeing any raised hands. Just want to be sure. Okay, then I'm going to move on to the next question. The next question is: What is your position on reallocating public safety and police funding in Davis? And please include specific examples. And this time, our order of response will be Colin Walsh, Dylan Horton, followed by Will Arnold. So please go ahead, Colin. Thank you. Um, I believe this is a discussion that we should be having. Uh, it's a discussion that needs to involve our police department, our community members. It needs to involve our commissions. Uh, it's something that, that really, uh, the time has come to talk about it in some deeper ways. Um, there are some positive examples out there. In Eugene, Oregon, the CAHOOTS program uh, has been operating since 1989 and seems to be having really good outcomes with vans of medical and professional service folks that um, are diverting uh, things from police interaction. Um, I would love to see something like that uh, explored either at a Davis level or possibly at a county shared services level. Uh, and these are the kind of things that we need to talk about, but it's a conversation that needs to happen as a community. Um, well, I, I and you know I appreciate the ideas that other council candidates have put forward. I view this as the type of thing that is not for one person to lay out just how to do alone. That this is something that we, as a as a whole community, with all of our you know great expertise and 
the, you know, and the participation of the police department itself, especially need to be involved in deciding how to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And now we go to Dylan Horton. Thank you. Um, you know, I think <clears throat> this is a conversation that we've been having in a number of different ways um, in communities across the country. You know, you can see uh, uh, pieces of this in John Lewis's uh, speech as a much younger man at the March on Washington a number of decades ago. Um, these conversations about the the, the inefficiency um, and and poor results in using armed law enforcement to respond to mental health crises, to respond to situations where individuals are undergoing some degree of a drug use issue, where people need uh, uh, help uh, and outreach uh, in terms of being homeless, where people are just trying to get down their streets safely, uh, separating those things from uh, armed law enforcement, from being delivered uh, at the end of armed law enforcement, and separating the 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 uh, habitation of those services and the funding of those services from the administration of the police department um, is what I'm concentrating on in the uh, Davis Police Accountability Commission and in this joint uh, subcommittee process that's been going on for the past couple of months. It's really drawing from the experience of communities uh, who've been uh, uh, in the streets sort of fighting for uh, enhanced accountability and reform uh, for many decades. Um, and I think that's uh, the, the direction that we need to go in. And I'll just say, um, it's been a number of forums uh, where uh, at least the, the, my opponent that spoke previously has sort of advocated for increasing the size of the police department's budget for increasing um, sort of armed law enforcement. And I don't think that's the direction that our community should go in. Thank you, Dylan. And now we're gonna go to Will Arnold for his response. Uh, thank you. So as a city council in my first term, we've made several progressive uh, police reforms, including the creation of the citizen led police accountability commission and enhancement of the city's independent police auditor position. Uh, we've developed an alternate dis dispute resolution process using uh, restorative justice practices as an option for folks who have had negative police interactions. Uh, we've also recently uh, en enacted a forward-looking uh, surveillance technology ordinance that was based on ACLU model language. We've instituted body-worn cameras, video release policies, mandatory training for officers in things like guardian mindset, de-escalation, crisis intervention, racial profiling, and implicit bias training. But in, in specific to this question, we've also taken important steps in my first term in strategically reinvesting the police department budget. The last three positions we've added to the department are homelessness outreach coordinator, a police services specialist to provide further support for homelessness outreach, and our only position added to the entire city staff in our 2020-2021 budget was for mental health crisis intervention services in conjunction with Yolo County uh, HHSA to respond to calls about folks experiencing a mental health episode. Uh, these are concrete actions that we've taken uh, in my first term on the council to do exactly what the question asks. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And I do see that, Dylan, you have your hand raised to give a secondary response. And Will, uh, you'll have a second opportunity right after Dylan to respond secondarily as well. Thank you. I think this is, you know, truly a question of leadership to a certain degree. By my observation, a number of the items that um, Councilmember Arnold has routinely sort of bragged about as police reform efforts that he's been involved in over the past couple of years have been sort of efforts pushed on the city uh, by community advocates or pushed through the city council by other city council members. So I guess my more direct question would be if the council member could respond to it, which specific police reform efforts has he been directly involved in? Which reforms can we attribute directly to his specific leadership? Well, I appreciate that question from Dylan, and he's ex he's describing exactly how effective policymaking happens. Uh, you take input from community members and stakeholders, uh, you engage stakeholders, and you craft policy, and then you support it with your vote. And I'm very proud of my uh, my involvement in that process, including bringing stakeholders who initially were uh, not excited about the idea of a police accountability commission, for example. Uh, uh, not in favor of things like this surveillance technology ordinance, engaging stakeholders, bringing them along, crafting effective policy. That's exactly the leadership position I've taken and that's exactly how it ought to work. 
Thank you, Will. And I'm not seeing any other raised hand. So I'm going to move on to Dylan. Did you raise your hand for another secondary? No, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to the third question. Um, what more can the city do to curtail climate change? And this time the order of responses is Dylan Horton, Will Arnold, and Colin Walsh. So please go ahead, Dylan. So what I think the, or what I've at least focused on, there's a whole lot that the city can do to uh, combat climate change, but uh, just what a little bit that I've tried to focus on is trying to make sure that the city um, is doing its part in uh, contributing to a more sustainable climate here in the, the city. The city uh, committed to a number of steps in the 2010 uh, climate uh, the, the cap in 2010 um, uh, in re regard to the, its use of recycled materials and it, in regard to its use of a green fleet. Uh, I think it's really time in the sort of upgraded uh, decade later um, uh, cap that we uh, increase all of those to the degree possible that we sort of use 100 percent, you know, recycled materials to the degree possible that we expand our um, vehicles uh, to to be uh, more sustainable to our operations. But I think we also should look at how we are designing our services in the city so that people are coming to City Hall less to get services. I think we've seen a lot of, uh, of um, sort of innovations that we didn't think were possible in this COVID-19 era where we've had to, for health reasons, uh, keep people away from City Hall. I think we can redesign some of these services to make sure that they're being uh, delivered to people um, and people are engaging with them in a more sustainable fashion. Great. Thank you, Dylan. And now we're going to move to Will Arnold. Well, thank you for that question. It is critical. Uh, this is the question of our times. The city council has declared a climate emergency and have been pursuing environmental sustain sustainability. Uh, it's an identified major goal of mine and of my council colleagues. Uh, this includes reducing our carbon footprint and achieving measurable GHG emissions, implementing the community's climate action adaptation plan, as well as coordinating uh, with organizations uh, to promote sustainable programs and projects such, such as the uh, Valley Climate Action Center Center, Cool Davis, UC Davis. Uh, we're also currently updating our, our CAP plan uh, to incorporate climate resiliency uh, and incorporating climate resiliency across all council actions. Uh, I would say one of the most important actions we've taken in my council term of, of any action we've taken is creation of the Valley Clean Energy Alliance, which is a, a locally governed energy provider and supporting its effort to deliver clean energy options to utility customers. Uh, we're also exploring implementation of programs to assist property owners in understanding the energy conservation opportunities uh, for their properties and facilitating expansion of residential and commercial solar and renewable uh, energy generation in the city of Davis. Uh, I'm also proud of the work we've been, we've done on electric vehicle charging infrastructure and the Electrify YOLO project, uh, as well as our uh, new non-residential reach codes. Great. Thank you, Will. And um, Colin Walsh, it's your turn. But just for the benefit of those listening, I'm going to repeat the question because we're doing great on time and I want to be sure everyone knows what the question at hand is. The question is, what more can the city do to curtail climate change? So please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a difficult question because, you know, the reality is climate change is a global phenomenon. And so uh, anything the city does is, you know, has to be understood in this larger context. Yet the city can and must do everything in its power to do our part, to be part of the solution and to be part of an example of what the solution can be. Uh, I'm endorsed by the Sierra Club because of my strong environmental background and environmental policies. Uh, one of the things that our citizens can do is we can vote against measure B, but this new business park on the periphery of Davis adds the 8% to the carbon footprint of our city it's the single greatest uh, environmental uh, change to the, that the city's going that the city wants to make, and uh, we're going in the wrong direction. We haven't made plans for how six thousand workers will get to and from their jobs every day. There's an expected twenty four thousand additional cars on Mace Boulevard. We just have to do better than that, and we we have to uh, come up with better ways to develop and better ways for economic growth. The, can't, the answer can't always be, well, the climate's just going to take another hit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. And I see, uh, Will, you have your hand up for a secondary response. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, I talked in my response about things that we have done in my first term. I want to talk about some things going forward. Uh, just this week, we'll be moving forward with a study of our fuel facility needs, and that includes beginning the process of, uh, of moving our fleet to hybrids and plug-ins and electric vehicles, and I'm on the record as favoring that transition as soon as possible. Uh, we're working with the state to uh, improve uh, mobility and modality along I-80, and today it's 90 degrees in October with smoke-filled air, so I believe our efforts must include bracing for the impacts of climate change that are here now and ensuring that the most vulnerable among us are protected. And I'm proud of what we've done as a council, including uh, the respite center and other things to protect those in need. Thank you, Will. Uh, we're about midway through, oh, Dylan, did you have your hand up? No. No, thank you. Uh, we're about midway through our questions and I just wanna repeat the uh, email address one more time for those who may be watching or listening. In case you want to submit questions, we will be taking questions up until 2 p.m. And the email address that you should use is ask, A-S-K dot L-W-V-D-A at gmail.com. That's ask dot L-W-V-D-A at gmail.com. Please submit your questions. Uh, make them applicable to all of the members all the candidates and we'll be answering questions between two and 2.30 today. So I'm now gonna move on to the fourth question. The recently developed downtown plan will affect all residents of Davis and the new council will be responsible for its implementation. What is your understanding of the status of the downtown plan and what are your top priorities for implementing it? And the order of response this time is Will Arnold Colin Walsh, followed by Dylan Horton. So please go ahead, Will. Will, you're muted. Sorry, it said the host muted me. That's okay. Uh, so currently, uh, city staff and our consultants are working on uh, the environmental review process and addressing public input, as well as uh, finalizing the uh, water assessment and traffic study. Uh, the draft EIR is expected to be completed and ready for public review in February of next year. Uh, the first uh, a part of that process is the notice of preparation, which uh, will begin this week, kicking off a 30-day public review period uh, to assist in developing the scope of the EIR analysis. Uh, there's also several public meetings scheduled, including a public scoping meeting uh, on October 29th and two planning commission workshops uh, scheduled for, I believe, this month and next. Uh, after the EIR process is concluded in the spring and the final EIR is published, it will be ready for planning commission and council action uh, by early next summer. Uh, in addition to being a key part of our updated general plan process, you know, I see major advantages of the downtown plan as finding space in town for increased densification and increased building height, as well as mixed use capability so we can get folks living, working, shopping and recreating in one place all, and all of the benefits that come with that. Uh, in addition, form-based codes are more resilient, flexible, allowing for predictability and future development, helping businesses and encouraging walkability and livability. Uh, you know, it's my hope that the downtown plan will serve as a catalyst uh, for development and investment in our community and in our infrastructure, specifically in the downtown. Great, thank you, Will. Uh, next up is Colin Walsh. And please, Colin, let me know if you'd like me to repeat the question because I know these questions weren't provided to you ahead of the forum. Um, yes, if you could, that would be helpful. Sure, happy to do that. Uh, the recently developed downtown plan will affect all residents of Davis and the new council will be responsible for its implementation. What is your understanding of the status of the downtown plan and what are your top priorities for implementing it? Thank you so much. Well, my understanding is that uh, the downtown plan is, in, is entering into the CEQA review process, but uh, after talking with some members of the, the, plant, the people who were on the, the, the committee to uh, work on the downtown plan that there's there seems to be a lot of questions still as to just what is going into CEQA review. Um, so I have some real questions about transparency of process and community involvement in the plan. And, you know, this is a major question for Davis is what do we want our downtown to look like? And, you know, what are the charms and qualities of the Davis that we have that we need to keep going forward? And uh, 
how can we do this in a way that's sustainable and resilient? And it seems that there are still quite a few questions that need to be addressed and answered. Um, my concern for the downtown plan is without more transparency and process that we are, that it, it's, it's a process that could lead to conflict. And I would like to see processes done in such a way where there's, uh, you know, ample significant community involvement and council involvement uh, as well. So, you know, on the council, uh, I, I will be looking to make sure that we have as much community involvement in the process as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And Dylan, uh, please go ahead and I'm happy to repeat the question if you'd like. No, it's fine, thank you. Uh, so I, um, well, the first thing I was gonna say is I think this is a kind of a good model of public engagement. That was why I was kind of frowning at some of the, the last couple of comments, but I, I think, you know, I also have heard from just people in general about the need to make sure that the sort of public policy development processes that the city goes through uh, be more open and accessible, um, uh, particularly to public input um, to the many people who uh, have a lot of free time, a lot of expertise and issues uh, relevant uh, to the work of the city. Um, I think uh, it's I, it's really important that, that so much of the plan focuses on uh, making obviously downtown a more vibrant economic uh, center for the community, um, but also making it a more accessible um, uh, uh, center for the community. I held a number of round tables before I started the campaign and one of them was on senior issues. Actually, one of our uh, hosts here was a participant in that uh, round table. Um, but uh, a lot of our, our conversation in that round table focused on um, transportation access to downtown. I was a little surprised. And I, so I think number one, we, we have to be sure that people can access downtown and get there and get out and be able to participate in what's going on there. If you don't uh, have uh, you know easy access to downtown, you have a real serious limitation to your uh, uh, you know you know participation in the Davis experience. Um, so making sure that it is a place where we can have more mixed use, we can have uh, more accessibility. I think is all something that we should support. Thank you, Dylan. I am not currently seeing any raised hands for secondary responses. I did see one before, but not raised now. Does anyone want to make a secondary? No, that was a misclick by me, sorry. Very good. No worries, just checking. Um, excellent. So we're gonna move on to the, the fifth question. The city faced, oh, and I should explain that the order of response here will be Colin Walsh, Dylan Horton, followed by Will Arnold. The question is, the city faced financial problems before COVID-19. How can it dig out of an even deeper financial hole now? And Colin Walsh, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, I commend the city for taking some necessary action to respond to the projected 20 million loss to the city revenue uh, with reductions to programs, projects and furloughs and city staff. Um, we'll need to monitor this very closely and be proactive to assure um, a positive physical health for our city. Uh, talking with local downtown dope business owners and uh, our community and hearing such concern for the downtown, I do think that even in the, the you know, we while we are cutting and making these difficult choices, and believe me, there are going to be difficult choices, we also have to be ready to make investments in key places to make sure that our, um, things like our local businesses survive and uh, can thrive coming out of this. So uh, that's, that's my perspective on the, on the economics for, for our city. It's gonna be a tough, there's gonna be a real tough challenge. Thank, Thank you, you, Colin. And please go ahead, Dylan. Uh, thank you. Uh, similarly, I support some of the actions that the city took uh, earlier this summer to sort of push back a number of infrastructure projects um, and to um, push back a number of uh, hirings uh, for city positions that uh, would have uh, you know, increased the um, sort of financial mandate of the city in a time where we de definitely didn't need something like that. Uh, I think um, similarly ongoing, we're going to have uh, if the crisis, you know, from a healthcare perspective continues to be as it has been for the past couple of months, we can assume that the economic uh, area of the, the crisis is going to continue. Um, and I think uh, the, the city should 
um, be prepared to take, you know, some some further actions like that to, to, to further push back. Um, you know, all of our things that, that the city is funding now are needed, uh, but we're pushing back needed infrastructure projects. We might be further pushing back uh, staff hires. Um, I do think that the, the city council members at the very least should outline some principles and areas that they're not willing to go. And at least for me, um, that, that means, uh, you know, the cuts to our most critical services and the, the sort of um, most bedrock promises that we've made to our staff who stood by us in public service throughout all of this crisis. That's definitely things like retiree medical. Um, so I think uh, cuts to our, uh, you know, most, most critical staff um, and uh, our most critical services, excuse me, um, and staff benefits, I think are lines that I wouldn't want to cross as a council member. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, please go ahead, Will Arnold. Thank you. So this is something I'm uh, very proud of in my first term on the council. Uh, you know, our budget is more secure now, even despite the current economic challenges that we're facing. Uh, when we faced the Great Recession about a decade ago, um, uh, we made some uh, some deep cuts to our city budget, including uh, reducing the number of folks we have on staff. And those were very difficult cuts that were made. Uh, but since then, in the good times, uh, uh, many of our other neighboring jurisdictions uh, hired like crazy. And the city intentionally was very prudent about hiring. And we've only been hiring uh, one position a year. Uh, the only exception being uh, uh, firefighters that we hired that actually ended up saving the city money because it reduced the overtime burden to the city. Um, and that's something that I think we should all be very proud of our city. Uh, we also were, able, as a result, we were able to face this current economic crisis uh, without having to resort to any layoffs. Uh, we were able to achieve uh, um, some of the budget reductions that were necessary through, um, through agreed upon furloughs with our bargaining units, which is which not all cities were able to say that and some had to go the, the route of, of layoffs. And, and so I'm so glad that the work we've done ahead of time uh, to, um, to be a prudent in our budget has, has allowed us to forestall some of those major deep cuts. And I just raised my hand so I could continue, if I may. Okay. <laughs> I was told that was an option. That was um, uh, so um, I, I would, uh, would say that, of course, uh, I'm somebody who believes in, um, in uh, upholding and standing by our commitments. So that is something that is off the table. Some commitments we've made to our employee groups are off the table. And if we're gonna, uh, if we're gonna um, uh, uh, touch those in any way, it's gotta be through mutual agreement with our employee groups. And I would just say quickly with regard to the business community, you know, this Healthy Davis Together initiative with UC Davis, uh, a big part of it is to help support our, our local businesses in this tough time. We've also instituted Open Air Davis, which is uh, these weekend street closures, as well as other strategies to help our downtown businesses in this incredibly tough time. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And um, not seeing any other secondary responses, no raised hands here. So I'm gonna move on to our sixth and final question. And the order of responses for this one will be Dylan Horton, Will Arnold, followed by Colin Walsh. The sixth question is, what can Davis learn from other California cities that have high housing costs, low housing availability, and limited afford affordable housing, such as Arinda, Palo Alto, Santa Barbara, et cetera. So please go ahead, Dylan. Dylan, I think you're muted still. There we go, thank you. Um, so we're all um, as communities, particularly across California, going through this uh, together, unfortunately. And so I don't think that there's a whole lot more um, as far as you know, innovative practices that we can borrow from other communities. But what I do think um, we can learn something from is what's you know, working long-term, what's, uh, what's been able to, uh, what, what people have tried and hasn't been successful in other communities. And we can learn a little bit um, from that. And I think uh, that's why we need to um, uh, expand the stock of affordable housing in this community, sort of, you know, definitely sort of capital A affordable housing, but also below um, market rate housing, um, because that tends to be a particular barrier um, in other communities that have similar characteristics to Davis in, in California. 
Um, and but it's also just anecdotally and in the 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 uh, experience of people here in Davis, a big barrier. Um, and I think uh, we, you know, we were one of the final communities, college communities to pass a renter's rights ordinance and to develop a renter's resources program. And I think um, uh, further investments into that, I know this is a difficult thing in an economic crisis, um, but the city I believe hired sort of one part-time staffer to be able to, um, you know, uh, lift up and make that uh, program work as best as it possibly could. Um, and so if we can, uh, give the full staffing resources to that program uh, and resources sort of backed up by other offices in the city, I think we can go a long way to improving uh, lease practices and quality in housing in Davis. Thank you, Dylan. And now we're going to move to Will Arnold. Thank you. This is an important question. When I was running for election uh, in 2016, I was asked at the time what the biggest issues were that we were facing as a community and the housing crisis was always at the top of that list. We hadn't approved any market rate rental housing in several years uh, prior to my election and the vacancy rate in town was 0.2%, which is effectively zero. Uh, we as a council uh, have taken the housing crisis head on since I was elected. We've approved several projects, particularly multifamily housing. Uh, also prior to my election, no projects had passed the voters that were subject to Measure J. And since my election, we've brought the community along to approve the first two Measure J projects in city history. Uh, both were housing projects. Uh, all of these projects were controversial with significant opposition, both political and via lawsuit, including folks suing to overturn the will of the voters. Uh, but I said I was going to do something about the housing crisis, and I have done so repeatedly. Thank you, Will. And finally, Colin Walsh, please go ahead. Colin? Well, there we go. I just unmuting. Very good. Well, this is a really important question, and uh, I got to say, I've I've really been following closest uh, Culver City in Southern California, where my friend Megan Sally Wells uh, just finished her second term as mayor. Um, they have this the same housing problems we do, uh, but with huge uh, Silicon Valley type impacts as Amazon and uh, has opened new studios in their town. Um, and the gentrification has, has just gone through the roof. And what I, what I really see from talking with her and watching down there is that development, developer driven projects alone will not bring affordability to housing. That there has to be very, because the, the de demand for housing is so elastic that um, you can build and build and build and it will, the prices will stay high. That there has to be very specific um, thought on the part of our council to how to bring affordable housing. And uh, we, need a, we need to redo our affordable housing policy with that in mind as soon as possible so that uh, we have, uh, you know, the best possible affordable housing for our city. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Colin. That concludes our six moderated questions. And now each candidate is going to have time for a closing statement of one minute. And the order here is going to be Will Arnold, Colin Walsh, followed by Dylan Horton. So please go ahead, Will. Well, again, thank you to the League uh, for hosting uh, and to everyone who joined us today. I'm proud to be a part of a city council that is so collaboratively focused on the good of our residents, especially now. We don't always agree, but we listen, learn, and at the end of the day, we put what's best for Davis families first and foremost. That's why I'm especially honored to have the trust, respect, and support of every one of my Davis City Council colleagues. Things are so tough right now and likely will be for a while. The choices we make have very real impacts on the people we serve and with policy, the devil's in the details. So having council members that understand, have experience, and know how to get things done is critical. We also have a tremendous opportunity and I continue to have hope. I'll remain a steady collaborative voice and will continue to lead with passion, dedication and love. It's an honor to serve and I hope that I can earn your vote and the continuing opportunity for us to work together. Thank you, Will. Please go ahead, Colin Walsh and make your closing statement. Oh, Colin, you're muted. 
Thank you again to the League of uh, Women Voters for the Davis area for organizing the forum. I know it takes a lot of work. Um, I care deeply about my community, about our community, uh, and I have for years. Uh, if elected to city council, I'll work closely with my colleagues to improve the process for better community involvement and smart planning. I wanna take a moment to thank the five former mayors who've endorsed me, Joe Cravosa, Bill Copper, Mike Corbett, Sue Greenwald, and Ken Wagstaff. But a truly touching endorsement to me is from Lydia Baskin, my second grade teacher. That really means a lot. Um, I'd like to invite community members to contact me through my website at www.walsh4davis.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. And Dylan, please go ahead with your closing statement. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to the League for putting it together this forum and for the service that y'all have provided in uh, informing voters uh, all of these past years uh, with a little bit of a gap. Uh, I, I am um, running for Davis City Council because I believe we can provide a really tremendous opportunity to our community. We, we ha already have provided a tremendous opportunity to our community to change the course of our future, to design a community that, that is inclusive and is accessible. Um, since we're talking about endorsements, I'm, I'm glad to have the support of former assembly member Mariko Yamada, uh, former uh, uh, school board president Cindy Pickett, and our current mayor, Gloria Partita. Um, if you want to find out more about my uh, campaign, you can uh, visit DylanForDavis.com. I spelled it again, and I'll spell it now. That's D-I-L-L-A-N, the number four, Davis.com. Thank you all. Thank you, Dylan, and thank you, candidates. So it is now uh, just about 1.50. And we're gonna have a brief interlude while we assemble and collate the questions that have been coming in. And during this time, you're gonna hear a message from the league president, Mary Jo Bryan. She's gonna provide a little more information about the league. But those who are here listening and watching, please stay tuned. We will be coming back on. We'll be here, but we'll be coming live again um, after uh, two o'clock with questions and answers from the candidates. So if you still have a few more questions you want to submit, again, the email is askask.lwvda at gmail.com. And we'll be accepting those till just about two o'clock and we're working hard to collate them and come back to you. But I'm going to turn it back over to Mary Jo for some more information about the lead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I on? Can you hear me? Good, okay. Um, this is what an opportunity. I'm proud to be able to talk a little bit about the League and the history of the League. Um, the League of Women Voters of Davis, and I'm not sure I have, how many of you know, was born actually in 1957 under the leadership of a future mayor, Sandy Motley. It grew into a vibrant nonpartisan organization and thrived for many years doing community service for Davis. After years of that dedicated service to the Davis community, and lead, the leadership faced the reality of diminishing active members and the lack of younger members to take over the leadership. And the league disbanded itself in 2014 and 15 there. However, uh, given the political climate of the time, in May of 2019, a group of four individuals, Bob Fung, myself, Mary Jo, Georgina Valencia, and Matt Williams met over coffee to discuss how to recreate, reestablish the league in Davis. This initial group of four, we researched the organization of the first league and its history and followed the steps established by the state league to renew the league. And the state league on August 4th, 2019 announced the Davis chapter officially, uh, officially a, a or a chapter in, in um, a, a chapter in progress. Our current board members include myself, Mary Jo Bryan as president, Bob Fung as vice president and voter service chair, Judy Harrison as membership chair and voter registration chair, and Como Hawk as social media and marketing chair. The healthcare committee is chaired by Michelle Famula. Along with the five of us, we are grateful for all the members who are actively working to provide nonpartisan community forums, voter education material, and get out the vote in the upcoming November 3rd election. Highlights of our first year included a forums on the general Davis general plan, 
housing discrimination and affordable housing, two healthcare forums, and our local candidates forum for county supervisor, city council, school board, and our voter registration where, uh, where the league members helped 1300 UC Davis students register to vote for the 2020 primary election on March 3rd. Currently, we have close to 130 members, including six men and 24 household members, which committed to providing nonpartisan community education. And I just wanna briefly say that we are now working uh, with the elections department regarding assisting with get out the vote. And we've distributed about 3000 flyers, Spanish and in English to various uh, community organizations who um, distributed them through the, like the food bank and through Meals on Wheels and through the library of the flyer. And league members will be again assisting on November 3rd with the election. I invite all women and men to consider membership in or a donation to the League of Women Voters of Davis area. Our education fund is 501c3 and supports activities like the one you are attending today. We appreciate your participation and invite you to check us out on our website at www.lwvdavisarea.org. That's lwvdavisarea.org. We are stronger together and together we make democracy work. And if I still have a little bit of more time, and I think I do, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of history if you can bear with me. In August, this August of 2020, we celebrated the ratification of Women's Suffrage Amendment, the 19th Amendment, after more than 70 years of demonstration, lobbying, and even being dragged off to jail, women to get got the vote. The women's suffrage movement was the longest campaign in our history and the most organized. On February 14, 1920, as an outcome of the 50th anniversary of the National American Women Suffrage Association, Carrie Chapman proposed the creation of a League of Women Voters to finish the fight. With the ratification of the 19th Amendment, the National League of Women Voters was formally organized. The League of Women Voters of Davis was born, I said, in 1957. And on June 27th, the League held its first official meeting by the summer of 1958, completed the needed requirements to see the charter and gained regular official status. The League of Women Voters numbered 40 members in their first year and some founding members became trailblazers. For instance, Kathleen Green became our first woman to be elected to the city Davis City Council in 1958. And Sandy Motley would become our mayor. In the 1960 general plan, our league members served on each of the committees. The league, the league would change the political scene in Davis by developing Davis a, a Davis Know Your Voter, Know Your Town, introducing candidates foreign and producing voter information pamphlets for the, each election. They became the nonpartisan watchdog on government policy, observing government bodies and commissions for the public interest and for transparency. League members immerse themselves in city planning and observing government bodies such as the city council, the board of supervisors and the school board. As John Laughlin, author and historian said, they were part of the new and rapidly growing vanguard in Davis. The women of the 1950s, 60s and 70s threw themselves into this effort with enthusiasm. The league grew to over 11 members and, on local, and took on local studies, including the study of the city master plan in 1959 and 60. In June of 1960, the president, Virginia Isaacs, presented a seven point consensus to the city council that included support for a professional planning department. After years of dedicated service, as I've mentioned, the league disbanded in 2014. But my, my heart goes out to the women that began the league. Um, I fortunately, grew, I joined in 1973 when my family came to Davis. And I, I worked under such people as Sandy Motley, Peggy Epstein, uh, Donna Lott, uh, Charlotte Sobeck, then Musker, 
And those women provided me with the leadership training and with the, the spirit to belong to the league ever since then. So I really am proud to be a, a league member and to see the restart of the league. But I'm also so proud of the, the, of the men and women ha who have joined me and um, in doing this work. The tremendous, this is a, this, to put on this candidates forum took a lot of time and effort and we've got some wonderful members that are active and helping to do this. And we really could use some more. And um, we have a, a website and we have um, an email and we've got Twitter and we've got Facebook and we're really trying to um, reach out to more people and to, to be able to uh, uh, introduce the league to them and to their younger members and their families. So thank you very much. I'm not sure if you're ready. Are you ready with questions yet? Thank you, Mary Jo. I'm still waiting just a, a little bit. I think there yeah. may be a lot of questions coming in. And so if you have more information you wanna provide, that's great. Um, I'm also happy to exercise moderator's prerogative and throw out a couple of questions of my own as we wait, sure. whatever you yeah. like. Uh, I, I said what I have developed. So, and I didn't think I'd ever get through all of that. So I'm, I'm very, very thankful that I did, but uh, this, but the league has had everything that I said they did back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, we are still doing now. And um, so uh, we look forward to being able to carry on the tradition of the League of Women Voters in Davis. So thank so you. So if you have questions, Donna, or whatever, that would Great, be fine. Thank you. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm waiting on questions and I want to be sure they haven't been. I don't see any, they haven't come to me yet and that's just fine. I'm just gonna run through the, the kind of the rules for the questioning because we have a nice solid half hour for questioning. Um, each candidate will be limited to a one minute response per question. And you will also have a secondary 30 second response for each candidate for each question. So there's no cap on that. You just have one, one secondary response for each question. Um, we're hoping to present you with at least five questions and maybe more. Um, so the beginning for the order of questioning, uh, it will begin with Colin Walsh, followed by Dylan Horton and Will Arnold. And I'm going to just throw out a couple of my own questions that came up for me as I was listening. And so my first question to you is that um, uh, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act is designed to provide significant public participation in the environmental planning process. And so my question to all of you is, do you feel that there's something insufficient about the degree of public engagement that CEQA currently calls for? And if so, please tell me how you would enhance the public participation. And the first uh, person who will be responding is Colin Walsh. Thank you. So. CEQA has a, 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 a lot of good public comment opportunities to it. And a, a lot can be done, a lot depends on how it's implemented. Uh, you know, there was a whole question around the disc, would it, what type of an update would happen? And, and the different types of updates allow for different levels of, of input. So within CEQA, there's a lot of input, but there's also values uh, judgments that are being made by consultants and staff about uh, how public input gets made. But probably the biggest single thing is what is the project that's being put into CEQA in the first place? And if there's not good public input into the, into the project before CEQA starts, that's where the biggest problem is. Thank you. Uh, Dylan Horton? Yeah, from my estimation and just from my sort of observation of projects going through the pipeline, I don't see there being a problem with seek, with, with the uh, public input uh, allowed and sort of uh, solicited under CEQA. I think um, uh, uh, straying on maybe agreeing with my uh, previous opponent who just spoke, I, I think that the, the issue where we um, arrive at Davis is how much public input we are allowing sort of from the city side of things as projects move through the process. I think um, there tends to be a lot of 
concern at the back end of projects going through the process of uh, residents feeling like they haven't been adequately consulted, feeling like they don't really know what the details of the project are, even for people who are not, uh, uh, people who are, you know, well informed and are staying up on what's going on there. And so I think uh, there's something that there's more things that we can do uh, here and the city has already taken a look at that uh, just last year and sort of relooking its communication plan. Thank you. And Will Arnold? Uh, sure. Um, uh, obviously, CEQA is a, a very robust uh, process for community engagement. Um, it starts with a, a robust engagement process with regard to the scope, uh, even that you'll be looking at uh, in the CEQA process, uh, as well as um, uh, once that draft EIR is uh, created, there's uh, further opportunities for folks to, to weigh in on the on the varying impacts and provide uh, um, uh, written input uh, uh, that will be a part of the official final document. Um, uh, it's uh, it is quite a robust um, uh, process. Um, folks have uh, used it uh, as a way to um, to slow down a process that if they are predetermined not to like the income. That's not specific to Davis. That happens everywhere. Um, and so I know that our state leaders uh, uh, have been uh, looking at CEQA reform and, and ways to ensure that we meet, for example, our housing obligations uh, uh, and don't allow folks to use the CEQA process as a de facto block to needed housing, for example. Thank you. And I, I'm not seeing any raised hands for follow-up on that question. So I'm gonna move into some of the audience submitted questions now. And the order of response this time will be Dylan Horton, Will Arnold, followed by Colin Walsh. So the first question is, the relationship between the city and UCD is critical to the future of Davis. What ideas do you have to improve this relationship? And please go ahead, um, Dylan. So uh, yes, the relationship between the city and the campus is definitely critical to our city's future and its past and its present and you know every all parts of what uh, goes on here in Davis. And I think as far as improving that relationship, we have to um, be on the same page as far as goals. And I think that's what's uh, been a sore spot in the past uh, you know couple of years or so in that the incentives and what sort of uh, pressures are on say the chancellor's office. Um, are not the same pressures and in fact are often pushing in different directions from the pressures that's on a, a city management office or the city council. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're moving in a direction where we are at least somewhat on the same page about the expanding the availability of housing on campus. Um, I think we need to get uh, uh, further on the same page about the affordability of that housing on campus, but I think it's exploring opportunities like that where we can move forward together on shared goals. Great. Great, thank you. And Will Arnold, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, our relationship with campus is absolutely critical to our community. Uh, UC Davis has been around longer than the city of Davis. So in many ways, uh, um, the campus and the students uh, predate the city. Uh, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, some of the work that we've done to improve that relationship since uh, in my first term on the council, uh, I would say uh, this MOU that we reached with the university with regard to housing uh, is very important. It was a, a landmark thing that put some real uh, teeth uh, behind uh, um, addressing the campus adequately addressing and frankly living up to its previous commitments uh, to house uh, uh, students on campus. They committed to 100% uh, of the new student uh, enrollment as well as uh, achieving something they have long uh, promised, uh, which is 50% uh, of, of students being housed on campus and then putting some real teeth behind that. Okay, thank you, Will. Um, please go ahead, Colin. Colin, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, any good relationship uh, takes nurturing over time. So, you know, we have to start up front with uh, good communication lines and we have to be persistent in maintaining those communications with the campus. I mean, the city of Davis has this enormous institution, one of the largest employers in the whole state of California you know, just uh, just across the street from us, the impacts uh, that the deci that decisions are made uh, 
at UC Davis have on the on our town can be tremendous. And so we need to be, we've, we've done, we've had lower moments. We, we've had better moments. We're doing better than we had been, um, but we have to keep be vigilant and keeping that relationship moving forward. And the teeth in, in, in making sure that that housing happens, that there's some question there and we really need to make sure that that housing really does happen and at an affordable rate. Thank you. Great, thank you, Colin. And I see, Will Arnold, that you have your hand up for a secondary response. Please go yeah, ahead. Thank you. I'd be remiss in, uh, in, our, in talking about the campus and not mentioning the Healthy Davis Together initiative. I mean, ensuring the health and safety of our community is absolutely our most important job. Uh, and we're working in close partnership with the university to help protect all our community members. This includes robust testing, contact tracing, and utilizing the experience and resources of the university and the UCD Med Center uh, to, uh, to assist us during the pandemic. Uh, uh, and messaging education campaigns to impress the need for responsible behavior. Uh, that's a critical partnership that I'm very proud to have been a part of. Thank you, Will. Uh, Dylan, I see that you have your hand raised for secondary. Please go ahead. Yes, I need to start exploring this opportunity to add more time to myself. Uh, so um, one thing that I think we need to go forward on and increase partnership with the campus is on our economic development. You know, uh, the sort of bread and butter of economic development for any community is trying to draw on or amplify really its um, pull factors. It's, you know, what reasons do you have to start a small business or a company in town? And we need to work better with the campus in um, creating and developing those opportunities. Great. Great, thank you, Dylan. And I'm not seeing any other raised hands. Great, so I'm gonna go on to the next audience question. These are great questions. So thank you, audience members. Um, scrolling through them, I'm going to, so the next uh, one I'm gonna ask, the order of response will go from Will Arnold to Colin Walsh to Dylan Horton. This question is, what would you say is the best and the worst decision made by the city council in the last four years and how would you improve the decision making process so please go ahead will arnold let's see the best decision of the last four years uh i'm gonna go with uh um uh, valley clean energy that's a big uh, uh important long time long a lot of work in it really progressive i'll note that the same night that we dealt with that issue uh the turkeys uh, uh, was also at issue. And of course, that's the one that all the media, uh, regional media covered, except of course, the Davis Enterprise, they were on top of the real important issues of, of, uh, of uh, about creating the VCE. And I'm just so proud of that. Um, we've done a lot of great things on housing too, but I would say the one single thing. Um, uh, I, uh, um, the, the worst thing, what, what was the question? The, the worst decision that we've made? What is the worst decision? Look, our community has long been advocating that we switch to uh, renewable sources of energy. I uh, When we had an opportunity uh, that presented itself, we jumped at that opportunity. It would provide resources for the city. I'll raise my hand and, and give up my time, but I'll make sure to finish that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Colin Walsh, you're up next with the same question. I'm happy to repeat it if you like. Um, sure, would you repeat? That would be great. Sure. Um, what would you say is the best and worst decision made by the city council in the last four years? How would you improve the decision-making process? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so while I, I would have preferred a DMUD solution I do have to say that Valley Clean Energy is a is a significant step forward for uh, bringing green energy to our to our, our town. Um, as far as the worst decision, you know, rather than picking a single council vote that as the, as the, the the highlight of you know what is the worst one decision, I think it's the it's the the decision never to take up the process and make sure that. Our decisions are moving forward in as transparent a way as they can. And the, the Bright Night decision is just an example of that process where the, uh, you know, the city moved to do a 49 year no bid lease with, you know, and they were pushed to do it in a rush uh, without going to any commissions. That's, that's a good example of that. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And Dylan, please go ahead. 
Yeah, so I'll go ahead and qualify. This is probably not the best and worst decision, but one that I think is on the better end and one that I think is on the worser end. One uh, that I have already mentioned, the creation of the Rental Resources Program and the Renters Rights Ordinance here in Davis. You know, we were one of the last communities, as I mentioned before, to create um, uh, an ordinance like that and create a platform um, for increased uh, uh, fairness uh, and quality in housing in Davis. And I think that was really important. As to sort of in the worser sort of end of decisions, um, the city, um, goodness, I think it was just earlier this year that the months and COVID time all sort of run together, uh, but the city authorized the purchase of another armor or of an armored rescue vehicle, of an armored vehicle for the police department. And I think just sort of in these times, it just really didn't make any sense. There wasn't really articulated uh, reasons sort of put forward for why it was necessary. Um, and the, the the commission was created, uh, council members, including council member Arnold Bragg about the creation of the commission, and then didn't listen to the commission or solicit the input of the commission uh, when that decision was made. Thank you, Dylan. Um, Will, Arnold, I see that you have your hand up for a secondary response to that. Well, I think it's important that I, I mentioned that uh, um, I believe in police accountability, uh, but I don't believe they ought to be accountable to active shooters. Uh, I, I'm proud that I uh, um, afforded our police uh, with the tools they need to keep themselves protected. Um, rather than having an MRAP roll into town as it had done, about a half dozen times before we acquired this uh, bulletproof Amazon van. Um, I, uh, I will um, stand with uh, the need to uh, address policing, but that does not mean I uh, am abandoning our police officers. If uh, I, I believe they ought to be protected in this way and I'm proud of that vote. Thank you, Will. Uh, any other secondary responses to that? I'm not seeing any. Okay, we'll go on to our next question. Uh, we touched on this one, or some of you have touched on this earlier, but I, I, I know it's an important and timely issue. So the next question, and I'll give you the order of response so you can be prepared, is Dylan Horton, Will Arnold, and Colin Walsh. And it's a two-part question regarding DISC as, or Measure B. And the, the question is, what is your position on Measure B and if it is approved, how will it affect downtown and MACE traffic? So please go ahead, Dylan Horton, with that. So I think there's two major questions for candidates here. You know, what's sort of your voting decision and sort of what should have gone maybe differently in the process? Uh, I plan on voting uh, yes on Measure B uh, when my, my ballot comes, I guess, in the next 72 hours or so. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, we as voters have, you know, one choice to make uh, to sort of balance a whole lot of decisions. Um, and and it, for me, uh, given, I think, you know, my concentration on economic development and our need to, to really expand the opportunities for that and the expansion of affordable housing, it seemed like on balance the best decision to make as a voter. I do think, as I mentioned before, that we, we need to, as a city, figure out how we can provide more opportunities for public input um, to, uh, to residents as projects like this are going forward. And as, as they are going forward uh, in the future as different parts of this project are sort of built out in the multi-decade sort of uh, rollout plan. I forget the last part of your question, I apologize. It's, well, how will it affect traffic in downtown and in the Mace area? Yes, yeah, so, so just consider me raising my hand just for a little bit of extra time. Okay. And that I think those are a little bit hard to, to picture out. I think a lot of folks are concerned about that for, for reasons, you know, that, that, that directly go back to, you know, recent Davis history and the build out of some other uh, business uh, sort of developments. And I think um, the city needs to, number one, figure out how we can make sure that uh, public transportation is, a, is as accessible uh, to that uh, spot as possible. Um, but if there are sort of trouble spots as it is building out over many decades, the city should work to address that between downtown business owners or business owners across the city and business owners looking to be a part of the project. Thank you. Uh, Will Arnold. So look, the DISC is the result of a community-led process that began decades ago. The latest iteration of that process that led directly to the DISC proposal began in 2010 with the Innovation Park Task Force. Uh, they identified the need for this type of a project, uh, the benefits of this type of a project. The DISC will create local jobs, high paying jobs for UCD graduates and others, generate more than $5 million annually for the city and $1.3 million annually for the school district. And it's the first project of its kind uh, in the nation to power all its buildings with 100% clean energy. So the idea that if we don't build it here, 
that somehow uh, the, the folks that are going to be going to work here will sometime, somehow disappear, we know is not true. And so at least here, it'll be 100% green energy buildings. Thank you, Will. Um, and Colin Walsh, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, I attended almost all of the commission meetings uh, for this project. So I didn't come to my decision lightly. I did everything I could to try to help this be a better project. And yet I saw commission after commission recommendation um, left out and uh, not even given to the council in some cases. Uh, and so I'm, I'm planning on voting against this project um, to address the question um, about downtown. The EIR says over 300,000 square feet of commercial uh, space is likely to be made vacant in Davis um, as businesses move out of the core. Uh, that's a huge hit for the core of our town. I've traveled across the country and I've seen city after city where peripheral malls and business parks are built and they kill downtowns. Mace traffic, well, Mace traffic, um, perhaps I should take some extra, I'll, I'll let it go. Thank you, Colin. And uh, Will, I see that you want to make a secondary response. Please go ahead. So look, I just will say uh, in conclusion that, you know, I think they, that DISC is an incredible opportunity for Davis to be a leader in our world, uh, to provide high paying local jobs, uh, to add, uh, uh, adding to that the clean energy and affordable housing commitments and economic uh, and uh, economic development and city revenue benefits of the project. I believe uh, it's an opportunity we really ought not miss as a community. So uh, I'm urging folks to vote yes on measure B. Thank you, Will. And Colin, I see that you want to make a secondary response. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so traffic, it's going to put 24,000 additional cars on MACE. That traffic is the major part of increasing the carbon footprint of Davis by 8%. You can, you know, you can do all this talk about green buildings, but as long as people are driving there from out of town, this is not a green project. And the, all estimates are that people are going to be driving in from out of town to, to, to be a, uh, working in this project. It's not a green project. So I, I have, that's why I have to oppose it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. Uh, next question and the order for responding will be Colin Walsh, Dylan Horton, followed by Will Arnold. This question is, how would you address the housing needs of groups such as intellectually or developmentally delayed adults and homeless individuals. And so Colin, you are first up on that. Would you mind restating the question? Sure. How would you address the housing needs of groups such as intellectually and or developmentally delayed adults and homeless individuals? Well, that's not an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, there's a lot of challenges to uh, addressing both of those. Um, the uh, Creekside that just opened will will provide some housing uh, for uh, that, that can get can help with some of the homelessness issues. Um, I'm concerned in how the city does get involved in this. Uh, you know. I, Renting 40 new apartments without good oversight um, seems like a real uh, could be a challenge. Yet, I'm at the same time I'm glad that the city is is acting. Uh, so, I, I don't know. I talk with my friend Harmony, uh, who works at the shelter all the time about this, and it's just clear to me that we need a lot more thinking and a lot more work on this altogether, and we need to include our groups like like the shelter in those conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And Dylan, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, at the end of the day, this is a supply problem. Uh, I mentioned in my opening statement that I uh, sort of from my day job, I work uh, supporting people with developmental disabilities. And, you know, working with a number of my clients, the, the sort of prospects of um, living independently, which is a big goal for a lot of people, is really curtailed or really pushed way years far into the distance because of the lack of availability 
of affordable housing in our community. So number one, uh, as I mentioned, you know, in, in our sort of housing topic, we need to drastically expand the availability of affordable housing um, in Davis, but also below market rate affordable housing. And we also have to look um, at uh, the diversity of housing options that are available. I know um, there were a number of my clients that had you know, some very particular housing needs as, to, as far as like where that was situated and sort of how it was set up and sort of making sure that there's not only a broader availability of affordable housing, but also a broader availability of affordable housing in different types is essential to making sure that everyone in Davis has access to quality affordable housing. Thank you, Dylan. And Will Arnold, please go ahead. Well, thank you. This is an incredibly personally important question to me. Uh, my oldest son, uh, Reese, has a developmental disability. He's in seventh grade now, distance learning at homes. Um, but I talk with my wife uh, um, a lot about uh, uh, Reese's future and, and housing and services that he'll be, uh, uh, he'll have access to uh, uh, in about six years or so when he turns 18 and is an adult uh, and beyond that. Um, and uh, I'll give a shout out to Summer House. Uh, I used to serve on the board of directors at Summer House for several years. Uh, this is a, 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 a nonprofit organization in Yolo County and there's a physical house both in Woodland and one in Davis that provides uh, housing and uh, services uh, for adults with developmental disabilities. They just do great work and, and I'm uh, uh, so proud to, uh, to have been a part of that too. This is something very important to me. Thank you. Thank you, Will. I see Colin that you have your hand up for a secondary response. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry, I actually didn't mean to have my hand up. Okay, great. Then we will go to the next question. And the order for responses will be Dylan Horton, Will Arnold, call, followed by Colin Walsh. The question is, what more can Davis do to increase ra racial diversity in city government? So please go ahead, Dylan. Well, you can elect your first African-American person to the Davis City Council. That's the way you could start. I really didn't expect this question, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> so, um, uh, so, we, so yeah, we can start by diversifying the boards that sort of govern uh, our local governments, uh, but also we can uh, start um, by making sure that diversity is a priority. Um, and making sure that, uh, in, I'm sorry, in our hiring process in the city. Um, uh, services uh, that are delivered to a diverse community by diverse city staff are often the services that are best, uh, uh, you know, uh, set to met the, meet the needs of the community and are most accessible to the community. So I think we do need to, uh, number one, as I said before, make sure we're diversifying uh, our, our local elected boards, but also uh, making sure that diversity um, in a number of areas, in economic class, in, in race, in, uh, in gender, um, in uh, sexual orientation, making sure that diversity in those categories is a priority at hiring and city staff. Thank you, Dylan. And Will Arnold, please go ahead. Sure, and I of course would uh, would add uh, uh, diversity of ability to that list. Of course, I'm I'm incredibly proud to be the only uh, elected uh, representative in the entire county at any level uh, who has a physical disability. Uh, and I've been told uh, by many folks uh, how important that is uh, for representation of folks with disabilities or just uh, um, seeing someone who looks like them uh, in, in this elected office. Um, you know, folks with disabilities are often um, assumed to be, um, to have uh, limits beyond just what is obvious. I would have when I was a kid, uh, folks would talk very loud to me as if I maybe couldn't hear them for some reason, even though it was just my arms were short, so so the so seeing someone, I, you know, in elected office who's 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 has the lived lived experience uh, of someone with a disability is is uh, is so personally important to me as the father of uh, two children with disabilities and 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 somebody with a lot of friends um, uh, uh, with disabilities. That's been something that's been so critical to me. Thank you. Thank you, Will and Colin Walsh. Please go ahead. Thank you. Well, this, this really goes right to a central theme of my campaign of community involvement. And one of the places that this can be best implemented is in how we recruit for our commissions and, and city committees. Uh, you know, an advertisement in the enterprise reaches a certain demographic. Uh, we really need to go further and do more 
to uh, seek a wide variety of involvement in our city commissions. And then those commissioners need to feel respected and valued and the, their participation needs to be um, you know, taken, taken into consideration uh, when recommendations go to the council as well. And so the starting with just much better outreach and then how, what happens next is important too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. And I see two raised hands and uh, Will, your hand was up first and then Dylan Thank will you. have another opportunity to secondarily respond. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, we don't have a, lot, a ton of time for these questions. So I did want to say um, it is absolutely critical that we have diversity of all kinds and, you know, uh, including race. Uh, Davis is not uh, a particularly racially diverse town. Uh, and um, uh, my opponents are exactly right that this is something that uh, our outreach strategies and being uh, intentional about how we um, uh, ensure representation uh, uh, throughout our city, both in staff and, and, and in terms of deliberative bodies like commissions is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And Dylan, please go ahead. Well, I'll just say that, you know, our, our diversity um, or lack thereof as a community, at least in the ethnic sort of realm, is not an accident. I've talked in previous forums about the fact that, you know, in, in many early deeds in uh, Davis, you know, it forbade uh, people passing down property to um, people who look like me. Um, and so that has an effect even decades down the line, more than a century down the line in the ethnic demographics of our community. But I did just want to underline the point that Mr. Walsh made about um, making that a priority in commissions, particularly particularly when we think that the remit of that commission would really benefit from that diversity, like police accountability, like social services and parks and recreation, we should really be um, highlighting diversity most of all in those areas. Great, thank you, Dylan. So we are just about at the end and we don't really have enough time left on the clock to actually have everyone respond to another question. So I think we're gonna wrap our forum here. I just want to thank all of you for participating, those of you who are candidates, and also those of you who are taking up your time on this beautiful fall day to come and listen. We really appreciate it. So we're going to conclude the forum now, and I thank you all. Um, the forum has been recorded, and it will be available on the League's Facebook page by tomorrow. And there's also a short survey for you, <clears throat> excuse me, for when you leave the Zoom forum. If you have a few minutes, the League would really appreciate your feedback. So thank you to all. Uh, please stay safe and have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.